So, quae nido bak, hindelo asin Denise Pulio sagama squa, wadelo asin Paul Pulio sagamo, kalasak band of the Pentecostal people, ta Kathleen Blake, uh, Dover Racial Equity and Inclusion Committee. Um, so, mio na ayan odana konipi. Hello, friends. My name is Denise Pulio. I'm the head female speaker. This is Paul Pulio, head male speaker in chief of the Kawasak Band of the Pentecostal Gabnaki people. And we're also introducing Kathleen Blake, who is a member of the Dover um, Racial Equity and Inclusion Committee. Um, we come here, Paul and I come here today from Odenakunipi, which translates to the place of the narrowing of waters, now known as Alton, New Hampshire. So if anyone knows Alton, you'll know the bay, and that's exactly what it looks like. So um, we start every presentation with a land acknowledgement. Um, we're incredibly grateful that we actually don't have to do that this time. We did that prior to our um, event beginning um, and we're incredibly um, excited. And I just realized this is spelling error. <laughs> All right, uh, the first thing is a misunderstanding of who we really are. Uh, I go back in and I use a lot of Jesuit records and we always hear that we're from the Dawnland, Wabanaki people. And it's true, uh, Wabanaki was really Wabanakiak, meaning the ancient ones from the place where the white light came upon the land as the sun rises in the east. Uh, what's interesting about this is after we've done a lot of research, the Lenape, which are now called Delaware, they claim they came from Siberia along the land bridge. And they came across many generations into what they call two sunrises until they came upon Manhattan, basically New York. They came up uh, out of the Ohio Valley and up the Hudson, and then they came into the New York area. They always called themselves their grandparents because what they did is they were like the leading party that went all the way from Asia to the all across North America. And as they came across North America, parts of their band broke off and formed other groups. Specifically, the tribes in Connecticut and Rhode Island were referred to as wolf clan uh, bands. And what happened is, what we can tell is they broke off from the original Lenape group and they formed the Mohegans, the Pequots, and the Narragansetts. We know that today, even though if I ever talked to any of the elders, they wouldn't recognize the fact that their oral traditions are based on the wolf as being a spiritual animal. Whereas the people from the north of northern New England always put the wolf as an evil character. So when we look at that paradigm shift, we can tell that it was many generations separating the ones that came from Asia and the ones that came from somewhere else. Right. So they refer to us as actually the original ancestors or Ice Age Paleo ancestors that were already here. Now, this is a devil in details. We can't prove it because archaeology here in New England is so difficult to analyze this. Nothing remains because of our soils. So our soils are so acidic, everything gets destroyed. So when you look at the oral traditions from the Lenape and look at what the Jesuits said, there was somebody here when they met and they said they met us somewhere in the New England area when these groups were breaking off. Right. And so the Lene Lenape called us the ancient ones or the grandparents that were here um, before you. I don't know, it's asking me to start my video. Should I be clicking that yes? It's progressing online, so yes, say yes. All right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so I just said a lot. Uh, if you have any more questions about this, we can explain it right. in more detail. So the reason why we know we've always been here is because we're one of the few indigenous um, languages that actually have words for paleo animals. Like we have words for mastodon. We have words for pterodactyl. We have words for camel. Camel's been extinct here for thousands of years. We have words for um, a woodland bison that's been extinct here for thousands of years. So we know that we were here and um, we know that because other tribes don't have the same language within um, their construct. When you look at our territory, it's quite extensive. We created this for the federal government. It's a, in the English terms, it's, it's doing meets and bounds, going by descriptive landscapes where we butted up against other tribal communities on river watersheds. And when we 
plot it all out, <clears throat> this is what the Abnaki territory looks like. To the far west, uh, east of us, is the Penobscot and the Mi'kmaq and the Passamaquoddy going into Maine. When you look at south of us, you're looking at the Nipmuc, Wampanoag, and other groups. When you go to the west of Lake Champlain, you get into Iroquois communities. Right, the Stockbridge, Muncie. And the Muncie's and all that stuff. And when you go further north, you get into the Inuit, the Pismet Inu, and those on the other side of the St. Lawrence River. So this is a very big territory. The Jesuit, comment <clears throat> the Jesuit commentary was quite interesting to us. We're only going to highlight a few things. First of all, they said we're very pious, righteous, and deeply spiritual. And we're, we debated everything. We debated everything, especially <laughs> with the Jesuits. We still debate everything. <laughs> we are monotheistic. Without a doubt, we had one God. It was Gisi Noascom. We were fully clothed. And we can prove this. We have renderings from early travelers that showed us fully clothed at all times, not like what they called regional savages. I hate and, that term. And they, when they talk about regional savages, they're talking about the Iroquois in the, in the New York, in the uh, Finger Lakes region. The Jesuits had relationships with them early on. And they always consider them real savages. Right. They called all of us savages. <laughs> so there's like no finger pointing here. Um, I just personally don't like that term um, because we were not savages. The Jesuits clearly prove that we were not savages. Um, so I find that incredibly frustrating. But it's the terminology that they use, which is why we continue to use it today. Um, we had an incredibly strong matriarchal society. Still do. Um, the women own everything um, and within the tribe. Still do. <laughs> <laughs> um, we uh, had fluid gender roles, um, so a lot of patriarchy came into our um, culture and our religion, and along with that patriarchy came um, gender roles. When we go back and we look at the way a village functions, um, we're not seeing those gender roles like they want us to think that they were there. Um, so if someone was a great fisherman, then they're going to go out and fish. I'm not going to force them to go home and cook. You know, um, so what we did is we utilized people um, for the skill set that they were given, and we allowed them to explore and, um, and um, uplift the community. Um, they're multilingual, French, English, and Latin. Um, people don't pay attention that when the um, Mayflower landed, that um, they greeted the English by saying, welcome, Englishmen. Um, people don't realize that by that point in 1620, um, we had already been taken captive and over into Europe. So we, so we had, you know, French, English, and we spoke Latin as well. And the Basque were here as well from the Iberian Peninsula. Yeah. So when you look at the history, European contact started in the early 1500s, not 1600s. Right. And and well, you go going, further back. I mean, you can talk back. about Vikings. We can talk about the Irish. I mean, there are other, um, there are other people, the Basque, you know, that were here long before that. Um, but we're not going to go delve into history like that because we're trying to focus on sustainability. <laughs> yeah. right. This is just our one little history block. Right. Um, um, and so, um, as we said, um, we debated everything. We still do. And everything is about consensus. It's about doing what's right for the community, not for myself. Um, it's about putting your own um, will and thoughts aside and doing what's, um, what's going to preserve the community for, for the future generations. Some of the interesting books that we delve into, we, re we reach out to try to find rare books that were written in the 1800s. Uh, some of these, like the one from Shea, uh, a good third of the book talks about the missions, the Jesuit missions here from that time period, really early on, fifth, uh, what do you give it for yeah, credit? 1599. 1599. And then later Jesuits like Vitramil, uh, which worked in Maine, documented things that were going on in the Kennebec with Rial. The Rial was another famous Jesuit that was in the main area. So we go back into not just English colonial records, but into the French and the Jesuit records, because that's where we find the rich history that's been not whitewashed or not you know, made into propaganda for the Puritan uh, religion. This is the real stuff. Right. And, People don't think about it, but we actually look in the pirate records 
We look at a lot. Uh, we of... look at so many different sets of records that are non-English, <laughs> um, because there's a completely different narrative um, of when they talk about the original peoples in this land. So in Dakinara homelands, um, so we had a, um, an extremely diverse um, ecosystem here: uh, rivers, streams, lakes, ponds, oceans, uh, the mountains, forests. We had more food here than we knew what to do with. We knew how to maintain our lands and we knew how to manipulate our lands to produce more food. Um, and so these are some of the things that we're actually trying to reintroduce into current society now um, through land stewardship practices. Um, so you'll hear us talk about um, replacing ornamental shrubs um, with blueberry bushes or other um, plants that actually produce food. Um, New Hampshire uh, produces less than 8% of the food we consume as a state. And so we are completely unsustainable, 100% unsustainable as a state. And people need to wake up and realize that we're in serious trouble here. And we need to think about what we're doing and change the way we're, we're acting in our society. Forget your lawn, grow tomatoes, grow lettuce, grow watermelons, whatever it may be, we need food. And you can start bartering with your neighbors, save money on your grocery bills. Um, there's a, there's, we need to change the way we think. When the COVID, uh, COVID broke out, we got into the task force for the state. We soon realized that our state is really a permaculture state. We grow grapes and we grow blueberries and we maple syrup, but we really don't have a strong agricultural uh, state. And that's our weakness. We just don't have people that are digging in the dirt anymore. And that's a, a big deficiency. And what we try to do is we went through this whole process with the state. We try to double down and say, we've got to really do better in our own food production. And that was one of the things we noticed right away is how, how weak our state is when supply chains break down. And I could go down that road for yeah. quite a while. So indigenous land and water use. Um, so our waterways were our highways. You sure we had trails. Um, many of our trails have been turned into the current highway system that you see today. Um, but our but our true highways back in the, at that time period were actually our rivers. Um, we could throw a canoe in there and the water would just swift you right down the river. It's a little harder getting upstream, but hey, you know, there's give and take with everything. Um, but besides being our, our main um, transportation routes, um, it, it was our main food resource. So um, people don't realize um, how important fish was, um, the omega-3s. Um, we had an incredibly healthy diet. It's, it's well known um, when you look at genealogical records to have Abnaki live well into their hundreds. Um, Paul has ancestors that lived into 130. And that was common. He, had he has an ancestor that had children at the age of 80. So life, it, it is possible to extend our life and live a healthier existence, but we have to stop polluting ourselves with, the, with what we're consuming today. We need to think about what we're doing and change our behavior. She said something interesting to me, and I just read this as a, an oral tradition. In the old days, we used to say the rivers flew, went back and forth. That was probably true. Like here, and you're looking at Dover Point, and you look at these tidal rivers, Maybe it was true when the glaciers were receding that the waters went back and forth before lakes and ponds and dams were built. So to some extent, oral traditions may have held true. All right. Another crazy story. Yeah. So as many know, um, indigenous people are known to be caretakers of, of Mother Earth. Um, we're hunters and gatherers, um, and we were one with the world around us. Um, we understood our connection with this planet and how we depend on the planet just as much as the planet depends on us. Um, just get chill. Yeah, I don't know what's happening with that yeah. pop-up window. I shrunk it, so I hope I didn't mess anything up. <laughs> um, all right, so, um, so what we're doing with, um, as when it comes to caretaking of the earth, we're addressing our generation, generational knowledge on how we took care of the forests and the waters. And you'll find out later on in the presentation how we're using that knowledge today um, by working with the state and federal government. Um, but what we're doing is we're trying to recreate the environment that was here when the colonials originally landed. 
So when you go back into some of the Puritan records, they talk about how they could run through the woods without fear of poking their eye out. There was not a single branch from here, from the ground to almost 10 feet up. Um, so we didn't have axes and saws. We could cut down trees to, you know, or split wood to, you know, for heating. We had to, we had to um, gather the downed branches. And so by maintaining um, our environment, by get, gathering all this downed wood, it kept a beautiful park-like appearance on these lands. And the Puritans talked about it quite frequently in their records on how beautiful it was and how they called it Eden. Um, another thing we did is we planted um, fruit and nut bearing trees, and we also genetically altered our, uh, our seed stock. Um, we understood that by, harvest, by collecting the first seeds and planting those for the next crop, we'd get an earlier crop the next year. And so what we would do is slowly genetically alter over time the, the growth of um, specific plants. It's not working now. Okay. Survival needs. Um, so this is where we're talking about the gathering of wood. Um, fire is the most crucial thing in order to have a village survive. Um, you need it for heat. You need it for food. Um, so when, you know, we've gone out into the woods and we call it indigenous tech, where we've taken tribal members and we've just cut them loose in the forest and said, live for a week. <laughs> and it's just to see what people do. Um, believe it or not, the biggest thing that we had to overcome is going to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah. The kids couldn't use the woods. They had to have a seat. And so um, we actually had to take a toilet seat, put it on two logs, and then life was okay. <laughs> but that shows you where we are as a society. You know, um, we need to stop and think about that for a brief second. You know, um, it's, I know we're all in our super comfort zone, you know, with electricity and everything that we have going on. But it's not going to take much for us to go back into some dark ages, you know, um, with society the way it is. And so um, to think that kids couldn't even go to the bathroom, um, it was just shocking to us. Um, we no longer have those issues. <laughs> <laughs> but how many in here? How, how many in here whose children or grandchildren or nieces and nephews would have that same issue? And we just don't even realize it. Um, so um, gathering wood, heating, um, our homes, um, a, a little tidbit. Uh, people always think we had fires in the middle of our wigwams. Wigwams were shallow, um, were low, like dome tents. You can't have a fire in a birch bark wigwam. Do you know how fast you'd set yourself up? <laughs> you, you'd just set yourself ablaze. We actually heated our lodges with stone. We would heat the rocks up and then bring the hot rocks into the lodge. So it was like a sauna. And y'all know how lovely saunas are. So we didn't have the issues that the colonials had with the cold and the food. We understood how to live in our environment and how to manipulate our environment to work for us. So here's, um, speaking of our wigwam, this is actually a wigwam that was built out on Star Island back in 2014. Um, this was done as an experiment. Um, as you know, Star Islands can have some of the worst weather um, in New England, and we wanted to see what would happen to a wigwam over the course of the winter. Um, so we built the wigwam out, on, out there um, when we came back in the spring. All right, so we actually decided to take some modern, you know, protection, you know, uh, stance with it. So we actually covered it with a, with a uh, blue tarp. And we actually found some of the biggest rocks on the island and laid them around the base of the wigwam to keep the tarp on there. Not only was the tarp gone, not only was the wigwam gone, <laughs> but the rocks were gone. And we're like, how can it take away the rocks? The um, frame was still there. But the frame was there, but all the birch bark was gone. Um, it was just really fascinating. Um, so it showed us that, um, you know, we have stories that we would break down and use temporary housing on some of these places. And now we understand why. You know, um, so we, we obviously understood before we did this experiment that it was probably going to go really badly, but we still need to have that data. We needed to show, you know, that yes, we tried, you know, that yes, this is what happened and we can document it. Um, so this isn't just about uplifting indigenous history. This is about us reconnecting with our history as well. Um, you know, we've been um, separated from our past. 
um, due to colonialism. And we were brought up to be ashamed of it. And so as um, adults now, and as the next generations are coming forward, we're trying to reclaim that history and bring unity, not just within our own people, but within our communities at large. She, she overstated the, how quickly it disappeared. It actually lasted for about four years out there. Well, the frame did. No, no, actually it did last. The first year or two, it did, but we had a major winter storm and, and that's what did most of the damage. Yeah. So we had seasonal migrations. We'll let Paul talk about that one or Kathleen. We've been doing an awful lot of talking. <laughs> Going. <laughs> we'll talk well, about plants later. Oh, plants. Well, the, plants are coming up. The season, we do know there were four seasonal uh, time periods and at least five locations. And some of them were very small village sites where we would do maple syrupping or hunting moose. We've got to pick up the pace. We'll probably look at the And there were, there were always a spring planting area along the rivers. And we also had seasonal uh, camps along the shore. So when you really look at it, there was a, a migration from inland uh, along the rivers to the sea coast and back again. And then small groups of the people went and did maple syruping or moose hunting. So there was always this migration along waterways to support the community over a longer time period. Right. We always maintained our main villages. Um, so they were never completely abandoned because obviously we're growing our crops um, up, up along the intervales. So we needed people there to maintain that. Um, but with that being said, it was also our time of year to gather the food that we needed in order to survive for the next winter. Um, so we would do a lot of fishing and hunting and drying of a lot of fruits, vegetables, and meats. And this was a major area. This was a major community right where you are right now. Right. Silver was not begun 400 years ago. It was begun thousands of years ago. Yeah. You're up. Oh, medicinal. Okay, so um, it, it's uh, the way to look at plants is not as something we we use, which is you know typically what people look at them as. Plants gave us everything. They gave us shelter. They gave us materials to make clothing with. They gave us medicines, they gave us food, and they still do. Basically everything around you, ex except for um, things that are, are not um, natural, come from plants or animals. So um, the, the elderberry, which is in the center on the bottom, I don't know if any of you know elderberry. It grows here naturally, and you can also plant it um, in your yard, you can get from uh, Stock Brothers. I, sh I don't know if I can say stuff like that, but I will. <laughs> Stock Brothers has elderberries. That's where I've gotten mine. Um, the, the little berry, well, the, the flowers can be used medicinally as well as the berries. And the berries can also be made into jellies, jams, syrups. And it's not hard. And um, it's incredibly effective medicine against um, viruses, colds, flu. So all you have to do is gather some, or you can even go down to um, the natural food store and buy some elderberries. You put them in water and simmer it for a while. Um, it'll turn purple. Then you filter out all of the solid part. You don't want the seeds or the stems or anything like that in there. So you can put it through a sieve or whatever. And then you have a syrup. And it's, it's, as I said, very strong antiviral and um, antibacterial. To make it even better, you can throw in some honey, but you gotta wait till the, syrup, till the um, liquid cools down to be 110 or below, or it will kill the medicinal properties of the honey. So wait till it's you know like lukewarm and then mix it in. I make it every fall and all winter long if I have the least sign of a cold or a sniffle, which now I haven't because I've got a mask on for three years now. Um, it, you know, I, I start taking a tablespoon every hour and it, it helps so much. So that's one you here can make, can use yourselves. These, these are gifts that these plants um, give us. If you can think of um, the gifts that people are given, you know, the, 
the gift of being a teacher or uh, a uh, carpenter or something like that. We all have our own special gifts. So do plants. And elderberry is a very strong medicine. Right above it is blueberry. I know you know blueberries. You probably love them like I do. They also have medicinal properties, both the berry and if you dry the leaves. The, um, they're good for, they're very strong antioxidants. And um, the leaves, if you make them into a tea, if you've got a sore throat or inflammation in your mouth, you can, you can take that tea for, for that purpose. Also for diarrhea. And, um, oh, it's, it's, what's the other thing it's good for? I don't usually use those um, medicinally, but, but it's, it's something that our, our ancestors would have used because we couldn't go to the pharmacy and buy a mouthwash. So um, there are many, many plants growing here in Dover wild that you can eat safely or that are medicinals, but you need to learn what you're doing so you don't make an error. And that would be a lovely thing to do as a community. Yeah. Um, so and, um, also on the screen, you're gonna see on the willow um, on the right, uh, the willow, the inner bark of the willow is actually aspirin. That was the base of aspirin. Um, so if you ever get a headache and you're out in the woods and you need a quick fix, inner bark of willow will do, fix you right up. A tea. Yeah, uh, yeah, you can build, you can make, make a tea, a tea as well. Um, so the cattail on the left um, is another um, incredibly popular plant for us. Um, cattail, um, we would use the um, leaves um, to weave them together to create cattail mats, which were used to insulate our homes, and we would let, you know be able to sit on them as well. Um, the uh, the brown um, bulbous fronds. Um, we would use those as torches when they would dry out and fluff up and they would explode with all the seeds. That fluffy down is, a, is an insulator. And so it, you can actually use it um, to insulate and keep yourself warm. Um, above and beyond that, that fluffy down is also, um, it floats. So in World War II, um, cattail down was highly prized by the army because they needed to make um, uh, vests um, life vests for all the servicemen um, and they didn't have enough cork so they went back to using the old way of using cattail um, to create life vests. Um, the jelly that grows at the base that develops at the base of the cattail that which is used as the protection from the water line as it hits the leaves that jelly is actually an antiseptic so there's your um, hand sanitizer next time you're out in the field and you can also use it as a shampoo so if your hair is a little greasy, grab a little cattail jelly and it'll fix you right up. <laughs> fishing. Um, so fish were our number one food resource. Um, we had millennia of predictable fish migrations. Uh, we could tell by the moon, the time of year, exactly what species was coming up the river. Um, it was um, incredibly easy for us to fish and it was the, um, the most important thing for food resources. I came from a four season fishing family and uh, we predictably would wait for the uh, first moon after the ice out and we'd go out and hand fish for smelt, the first migratory fish coming up upstream. And those traditions were continued in my lifetime. I'm, I'm over 75 years of age. Nobody does that anymore, but we did it even when I was a younger person. So fishing was always important, especially those fish that like the shad, alewives, the river herring, and the salmon were very important to our diet. And I don't know if we realized there was omegas, you know, omega fats in these fish, but we, uh, we obviously knew there was something good about it. We didn't like cod or haddock, by the way. Right, so there were no wars over when y'all were fishing the cod. Yeah. So we were like, take the junk fish, it's okay. Yeah, we liked the oily fish. It yeah. dried better and it preserved very well. And for whatever reason, we loved them. Yeah. Can, can I say one thing? Sure. One of the interesting things about <coughs> the seasonal migration of the fish <coughs> from the ocean into the rivers is that the placement of dams yeah. stopped that. So that heavily impacted the survival of the people living here because their food no longer came. But Exeter 
removed their dam. I don't know if you know about that, but they removed their dam a few years ago. Durham is also removing their dam, but the first year that we, the three of us worked um, with Exeter for river blessings and things like that. And when the dam was removed, the next year, the, the fish were running upstream. Oh. Yeah. So it can happen that quickly. You just have to get, you know, I'm not here to break down the dam, but I'd love if you did that. But, um, you know, so it's not a hopeless situation, right. in other words, because you've had a dam for, you know, 200 years. If it's removed, the fish will run again. Right. There is ancestral memory. Um, the fish will remember where they need to go. Um, what, so the rivers and the streams are the nursing grounds for these fish. And by us putting these dams up, we stop the fish from breeding, which is why the ocean is so depleted with fish resources. So it's imperative that we remove these head of tide dams to open these riverways up to allow the fish to spawn again so we can repopulate our oceans. Um, when we do archeology, span um, we can tell um, when we look at fish remains, it's one of the things that um, will actually come up and um, when you look um, at fish remains and you look at the cod, for instance, we were harvesting cod at around eight years old. Today, you're harvesting cod at a year if you're lucky. So it shows you how depleted our, our systems mm -hmm. were. You know, at that time period, it was no big shake to see a 30 or 40 pound fish. Today, you're praying for an eight pound fish. And that's considered a big score. So we need to change the way um, we behave and our thought process when it comes to the environment. And we need to make the adjustments now um, to create some of the um, mistakes that have been going on. So, um, so here's some, some slides about different fishing methods that we would have employed in the region. Um, so we would have had stone and stick weirs, um, fishing nets that we would have had plummets on for um, uh, rock anchors. Um, sometimes you'll still find them in the rivers. They'll be nicely smooth, um, almost like a grenade, if you will, um, nice and round. And they'll have a little knob at the top so you could tie the, the net and it'll hold the net into the water when you drop the net in. Um, we uh, had spearing stations, hook and line fishing, night fishing, um, where we would use torch light because the fish are attracted to the light so they'd actually come to us. Um, ice fishing, which many of you still do today. Um, beaching, where we drive the fish up onto shore, um, and by hand, um, where, where Paul has mentioned before, he, um, they caught um, fish by hand. The spearing stations, we actually know Garnick, the full word for Garnick, uh, all you see is a very end of the, the word Garnick, was spear fishing salmon from a high place. And all that was left of that whole phrase is Garnick today. So we know by rolling back the clock and figuring out what the word was, that every one of these places had specific fishing techniques or specific fish that were going after in that location. So we know right there in Rochester, salmon were being harvested. Right. I don't think Rochester's seen a salmon in a long time, but it would be awesome if um, we were able to get salmon back up into that region again. Um, so this is a slide that's showing um, different um, types of fish traps. Top left is spearing. Um, uh, bottom left is a, a eel trap. Um, the eel would swim inside that hole, and um, there was uh, the um, inside of the um, inside of that trap. Um, the ash is cut into spikes, so you can actually swim in, but you can't swim out. Um, and so, and then you have the fish net um, that's on the right. Uh, fish hooks, um, and then there's the plummets that I was discussing with the fish nets. Um, so you could see how the rocks would hang and it would keep the net weighted down into the water. Uh, stone weirs, is a, which is up at top, um, those you would have to rebuild every year. Or you would have a rock weir, which is like the picture in the bottom. Um, that act, that's actually a weir from New Hampshire. Um, so that is a local photo. Um, these sites are protected, so please don't ask me where it is. <laughs> Um, but that is an actual fish weir um, um, here in the state. Uh, these obviously you wouldn't need to be rebuilt every year, um, but you'd be able to come back and uh, do your fishing. So one of the, um, as we begin to talk about food preparation, um, I usually bring my really big mortar and pestle and I apologize, I forgot it on the kitchen table. 
Um, so what we like to show is um, how large these mortar and pestles are. And you can tell by the photo um, that they we would tie them to a branch of a tree. Uh, the mortars, the, the, um, the, the pestles and were so heavy um, that we actually couldn't lift them. I mean, we could lift them, but to repeatedly do that is just not going to, it's just not going to happen. And so we were, um, I don't know how we figured it out, but it's awesome to know that we figured out to be able to tie it to a branch that the tree would take the weight and the sway of the branch would naturally bounce it. So it was virtually no effort to create food. That's why food was so plentiful um, because it, like I said, virtually no effort to create it. Yeah. The one we we're going to bring was is about this big and it, it's quite right. extensive. It looks like a baseball bat out of, out of rock. <laughs> Um, so food preparation, because it's obviously one of the most important things next to heat and uh, maintaining shelter, um, is we maintain a common cook pot in the um, main center of the village. Um, anyone who happened to come through would kill, it happened to go in the pot. So you could have fish, squirrel, and raccoon all in the same place. Um, so, but uh, above and beyond that, um, we use birch bark containers initially um, to do our cooking, and we, we would heat up rocks. Um, and drop the rocks into the birch bark to, in order to heat up the food. It took a little while, um, but it is quite effective. Um, and then clay pots came into being. Um, clay, um, we, we could see in the archaeology that we were still dropping the rocks even in the clay pots. So we weren't just putting them on the fire and cooking. We were still dropping rocks inside them. Eventually, we got the clay good enough where we could put it in the fire. But when pottery was first being evolved, um, it took us a little while to make that switch. Can I, uh, can I say one thing about yeah. that? Probably many of you have clay right there in your yard. Um, it's, it's like a bluish gray color and the water just doesn't go through it. Sixth Street used to be called Brick Road because they used to make bricks all in this area because there's so much marine clay. So, all right. That's a good source for right. pots. So pottery, um, yeah, we would have used this clay. Um, we would have had temper to it. Um, there's a debate right now. There's some studies over, um, uh, um, <coughs> archaeologists are doing studies to figure out the different types of temper, <coughs> temper we use at different time periods. Um, it's really fascinating. I'm not a potter, um, but boy, is it fascinating. It appears we used crushed shell as we were closer to the coast. And as we went further inland, we ground river sand to a finer temper and so we can kind of tell where the pottery was made based on what the temper is inside the pottery yeah it's quite fascinating um so we did open fire um spit cooking where we would dry a lot of foods and fishes and smoking is another favorite of ours um here's some pictures of different types of food prep um so the top left is smoking um, the next picture to the right is um, hot rock cooking, where we would actually fry the food on a hot rock. Uh, bottom left is, um, is spit smoking, um, where we would actually um, put the fish on a spit around, surrounding the fire pit, and the fish would dry that way. The middle picture is an eel, and I call that my eel pop. <laughs> and, um, but that is actually how we would have cooked eels. We would have rolled them into a big old lollipop and, um, and then would have cooked them. And then you have um, plank um, cooking for fish and other meats. Super fancy now if you want to pay the extra money at the fancy um, restaurant. But yeah, you can do it home and it's an old indigenous way. Take a look at the picture on the lower, uh, the one with the salmon on the sticks, because I think we have a slide where we actually... Yeah, we'll actually be referring back to that, where we found a site here in New Hampshire. And you can tell by the site, um, and you'll understand what we're referring to. My water. Talking too much. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> While well, she's getting a little refresher here. Uh, interesting enough, uh, when uh, Henrietta, Helenetta uh, Silva wrote, Helenet. uh, Helenet wrote the history of uh, the game in fur bearers for New Hampshire, about a third of the book described Abnaki practices, which became fish and game laws in our state. You have to remember the, the, Colonial people had had no respect for the land be, or the animals because, you know, when they came here, there was no royal uh, involvement where they were forbidden from taking game. Uh, so what's interesting is, you know, when the royals controlled everything in Europe, uh, it was very difficult 
for them to control them here in this in the new world. So practices like hunting moose and and deer in the fall was not really observed until much later. And they took it from Abnaki learning how to house appropriately big game animals during the right time of the year. Does that make sense? So these became your, your practices today. All right. And so this is a slide um, discussing the Wabanaki food year. Um, it talks about um, the different um, fruits, nuts, vegetables, fish, whatever it was that we're eating during the course of the year and gives a generic um, time period on when um, those foods would have been plentiful. It's an interesting chart. Timeline, species, quantity, and what, yeah. how we did it. And if you want to look at that chart further or get more in detail, um, it's available through not, um, Notes on a Lost Flute. So contemporary activism. So there are 574 federally recognized tribes in 31 states. There are nine federal tribes in New England. They consist of Connecticut, Mass, Maine, and Rhode Island. New Hampshire does not have a federal tribe. There are no state recognized tribes in New Hampshire. New Hampshire does not have a recognition process as of yet. There are 67 state recognized tribal groups in the country in 13 states. Nine state recognized tribes are in New England and they consist of Connecticut, Mass, and Vermont. New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island do not have a state recognition process. I know that sounds a little contradictory considering the line ahead of it, which states that Massachusetts has a state recognized tribal group. The Nipmuc are state recognized in Massachusetts. However, it's not full state recognition. It was done by proclamation. So they may have state recognition, but it doesn't hold the weight that actual state recognition does. Actually, it's a colonial construct from way back. Um, there are 534 pending or unrecognized tribal groups currently in the United States. 42 of those groups um, are housed here in New England. We have no idea the number of self-declared tribal groups or tribal nonprofits um, out there. Um, the number is astronomical and it changes on a daily basis. In 1994, um, the Kawasak Band, our tribe filed for federal recognition. We were given the petition number of 151. We're still a pending tribe. Um, we, our determination has not been made yet. Um, we're, and so as we wait for that determination, we're considered a pre-constitutional tribe. We were actually recognized by George Washington himself. So we just have a different level of what's happening here. And it makes us um, a little unusual in the New England area because of that history. So we'll get into some of the projects that we're working on throughout the state. Um, this is a project with the Federal Forest Service um, where, we're where we're working to um, reintroduce um, traditional forest um, burning and maintenance practices. Um, uh, so by, in order to do this, we know we maintain the forest using fire. We know where we use the fire. What we don't know is how often we did it. And so if you burn too often, you can kill everything. If you don't burn enough, you can kill everything. So it's a fine line. So what we're doing is we're working with the feds and we're doing research um, through um, uh, core drilling and um, bog um, drills to reestablish um, what the burn pat the historical burn patterns are. We look are. for charcoal in bog areas where they preserve it. Yeah, right. it's a fascinating process, super technical, um, a little bit beyond me, but it's a lot of fun. <laughs> um, we established a Native American and Indigenous Studies minor at UNH. Um, Kathleen, Paul, and I are all affiliate faculty of that minor. Um, we are looking to establish Indian garden, uh, indigenous gardens on campus. Um, we are working with the university um, to remove ornamental plants and, and establish edible landscaping, because once again, it's about establishing sustainability for our state. Um, along with um, edible landscaping comes seed saving. Um, our goal is to teach um, people how to seed save themselves so we're no longer purchasing GMO crops. Um, we can eat whole, healthy foods without having them chemically altered. 
Um, one of the projects we worked on was giving indigenous names to the trail system on uh, mm -hmm. campus and within the ravine system. Those signs are all up. The trail system is active. Um, they have QR codes where you can interact with the website to hear the language being spoken and learn a little bit about um, the area. Um, this is just one of many projects that we have naming trails, um, not just here in New Hampshire, but we're also doing this work in Massachusetts and Maine as well. Um, and so we're all kind of all over the place and it's a lot of fun. So this is the Great Bay Archaeological Dig. Um, you heard me talk about that salmon picture where they're all lined up on the sticks. That's what that top picture is. So when you're looking at that salmon picture a thousand years from now, this is what you're going to see. And so what we're looking at here is um, a fire pit that was long and you could see where the salmon were lined up along the length of that fire pit. That dark area, that like um, kind of reddish, orangish kind of color, that's actually fat lipids that, that came off the fish and settled into the, into the soil. And so we took samples of that fat so we could figure out exactly what fish we were rendering. Um, it's, it's really fascinating. Um, so the bottom left picture is squash or a pumpkin seed, and the bottom right picture is corn. This site um, is incredibly unique because of the high sand content in the soil. Typically, seeds like this do not exist. It is incredibly rare to find seeds. And we didn't just find squash and, and corn seeds. They were actually in birch bark containers, and the containers were still reminiscent in the ground. So it was just really awesome to be able to find on um, this storage site. What makes this highly, um, um, you know, even more amazing is because for the first time, if the science um, is able to get us there, we'll de definitively know what species of, of corn and of squash we were growing at the time period. So we know we grew corn beans and squash, everybody knows that, but what type? And that's the enigma. And so we're hoping that um, this discovery will help answer some of those questions. Uh, part of, um, we just received funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, we got a, um, an American History and Culture Grant where we're gonna be using the Great Bay site that you know, we were just showing you, um, of that showing the intersection of indigenous and colonial um, mm -hmm. lifestyles. We're gonna be pulling in 72 teachers in, um, from across the country. And this is gonna be an immersive program where we're gonna be teaching the teachers the different um, methods that we're using to help do this research. Our goal is to not just discover this history within our region, but we wanna empower other people to do this in their region as well. And by sharing the knowledge and sharing the way we partner with researchers and others, this will give other tribal groups the ability to do this research in their areas. Um, so they have not put the applications out this yet before I get bombarded with questions. Um, but the application will be coming out, I think, in a month or two. Um, they're in the process of working on that. Um, the program will give you a, um, a hotel room and continental breakfast, a $750 stipend for travel expenses or meal expenses. If you live locally, who just who got a paycheck? <laughs> and, um, and you'll also get professional educational credits along with it as well. So um, one other program over at UNH is the CARPE program. This is a um, research program where we've partnered with the, um, with the Inuit in Alaska and the Sami in Sweden, and we're doing a climate study change project. We've, so the project is focused on teaching students and tribal members how to actually build the sensors. So we're not just buying them and then installing them. We're actually building these sensors, then we're going out to install them. The students are learning how to collect the data, um, how to interpret that data. And our goal, hopefully, at the end of the program is to establish an app where the um, international partners and ourselves can share the data in real time so we can compare what's happening in their region compared to what's happening in ours, so we can help each other deal with the, um, with the changes that are happening with, within our areas. New Hampshire Coastwise um, is another program um, that we're working on um, coastal and marine issues with the state. Um, this is a, um, a, a work group um, that's 
um, designed to not just help educate each other, but to build a strong communication partnership um, between um, community members doing similar work in those fields. Um, our goal is to help um, bring people together, start collaborations, and really getting some projects moving forward in a positive and uplifting manner, and help build, you know, help the students and professionals build the collaborations they need in order to get that done. So we have Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collectives. Some of you may have already heard of this, INHCC, um, indigenousnh.com. We're a grassroots movement of community members that are working together to uplift Indigenous history and to help change the current narrative that we're living through. Um, so our goal is to um, create an inclusive history of the region. So we're not just highlighting um, colonial narratives, we're highlighting all narratives. Um, so in order to have an inclusive future, we really need to have an inclusive past. And in order to establish an inclusive past, we need to talk about everyone's labor and suffering that came into the creation of this land. It wasn't just indigenous, it's not just black or Irish or you know Japanese. There are so many people that became the threads that wove this nation together. We need to acknowledge the turmoil that, that has been created throughout those time periods. We have over 30 silos of special interest groups within that uh, collaborative. Yeah. Uh, it covers a wide variety of subject matter. Um, one of the um, things that we have on the um, website is an interactive um, storyboard map. Um, this is where we're sharing um, local history and information as it's being um, discovered. Um, and honestly, it's about getting all the um, work to get the writing done. It's all the typing um, that really slows us down. Um, but there's a lot of history out there. Um, so the goal of this map is not just to teach indigenous history and culture of New Hampshire and the surrounding area, but to actually create a map where you can go and visit some of these sites. Um, our goal is to try to make it um, accessible, make it real. You know, um, people think of indigenous people as something of the past. We're here, we're alive, we're well, we're still doing the thing that we did all those years ago. It's just that we're not so public about it anymore. Um, and so what this um, map is doing is help bringing some of these locations that, that are near and dear to our hearts so that maybe hopefully they will come near and dear to your hearts as well. Because if we all have a respect um, for this region, then we're all going to want to protect it together. We also create the 13 Moons Lessons Plans. Um, uh, this is a curriculum that's available to the public for free. Um, for educators, homeschoolers, and the like, um, even you know people who are just interested in bettering themselves. Um, the information is there um, and for free. Um, the units um, talk about everything. Um, do you want to talk? You've worked a lot on the lesson plans. Yeah, um, they're wonderful. They, they're primarily for elementary school age. We're planning to work on stuff for older kids as well. Um, and it's based on the, the um, traditional indigenous calendar, which was 13 moons rather than um, 12 months. And there, there are specific activities that happen during each moon, you know, the, the leaf falling moon at the time when the leaves were falling, or um, the um, strawberry moon at the time that the strawberries began to grow. So it, it, they're really nice because they're interdisciplinary. There's a lot of math in it without being mathy. Um, you know, they have to read, they have to write, they have to, you know, they do um, drawing or artwork. So in what science, uh, much of it is science um, in social studies of our people. So um, they're, they're wonderful. You got to take a look, indigenousnh.com, you can see them. 13 moons. Do, do any of you remember when the uh, Children's Museum here in town had the 13 moons? the life of the Abnaki child. We, we took over the uh, Children's Museum uh, for one, one season, and we actually did a program in there where we indigenized the whole, uh, the whole place. Right, we labeled everything with the Abnaki words for whatever happened to be there if we had it. Um, we created an exhibit that went up the ramp um, that was interactive, touchy-feely. Um, yeah, we really wanted to try to uh, make our culture and our history accessible to everyone. 
Um, another program that we have is uh, food justice, which is um, um, it's part of our uh, 13 Moons curriculum. Again, um, this time we partnered with New Hampshire Farm to School, and we created an Indigenous Harvest Calendar. Um, so what we did is we highlighted um, the local Indigenous foods, and we broke them down by time periods. And the goal of um, this curriculum is so that teachers can work with their school cafeterias. And so if it happens to be um, I don't know, strawberries on the menu, teachers can talk about the indigenous uses of strawberries, how we grew them, whatever it may be um, within the curriculum. And then they would go to lunch and they would have the food. And so it was kind of like a full circle program where they could not just learn about it, but they could experience and taste um, that food as well. Most people don't know too that all beans, all squash and pumpkins and all corn is new world. Yeah. It went to Europe. It didn't come from Europe. Yeah. So anytime you eat a green bean, you're eating a, a food that's indigenous to this land. Right. 70% um, of the food the world consumes today, 70% all came from us here in North America. And we've just, they've taken our foods here and they've spread it out across the world. But 70% um, of it all came from us. You know, not even including the South American contributions like... Uh, Chocolate and other and potatoes. And, and coffee. Other, and tomatoes. Coffee. Tomatoes are not Italian. They're South American. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's a there's a lot. Um, so another pro program that we're working on is augmented reality. Um, and so many of you have heard of Pokemon Go where you can pull up your camera and you see the little Pikachu or whatever he is pop up in front of the camera, you know. We're doing something similar. But instead of a Pikachu popping up, it's going to be somebody um, carving out a dugout canoe or somebody's going to be building a wigwam or somebody's going to be tanning a hide. Um, so what we're doing is we're trying to bring indigenous history to life um, and make it accessible um, in that manner. Um, so we, we really thought the whole Pokemon thing was really fun and cute. And so we thought that doing something that with indigenous history would be a lot of would, you know, help bring in um, education and even tourism because who wouldn't want to come and check all that out how many younger people have that right in their face all the time right <laughs> you, you see what we're trying to get at here yeah so um the augmented reality we've actually partnered with unh and dartmouth um, college we have two different um, augmented reality programs happening right now um, with unh and indigenous <laughs> nh um, we have a pro our program is focused on Star Island, Odeon State Park, and Strawberry Bank Museum. Um, our goal, so each site will have um, a walking trail um, that this, uh, this is a free public app. So anyone will be able to download it for nothing and use this um, app. And um, they'll be able to walk the trails and see, you know, whatever it is that we popped up in the trails. Um, we have a similar program with, uh, so, the Indigenous NH1 is focused on Indigenous history and uplifting Indigenous history. Dartmouth is the focus of that project is to focus on the connection between Shaker and Indigenous life. Slightly different twist. All right. Um, so the goal of this is um, the Shakers learned what they were doing from us and they just did it better. Um, and so what we're doing is we're highlighting the relationship between the Shakers and the Indigenous, highlighting what they learned from us and how that knowledge um, benefited them. Um, one of the things that was really interesting about this project is, um, is one of the weeds that's listed in um, their records as being highly traded with us. Um, what was it called? Pickerel weed. Pickerel weed. How many people here know about the Shaker lifestyle before I go any further? Men and women had to live in separate homes. They weren't allowed to intermingle, completely separate lifestyle. Guess what pickerel weed is used for? It's a contraceptive. It's a contraceptive. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only thing pickerel weed is used for. <laughs> so we're going to maybe research what, what that was is. What really this? happening in the Shaker sites. <laughs> because um, based on their own records, it does not follow their religious practices. <laughs> So um, very interesting. Um, stay tuned. Um, the research is still being done, but um, it should be a fun time. Uh, Another project we have that's actually going to be coming out in an, um, a matter of weeks. Um, the project is actually the film has been completed as of last Tuesday, 
We are now just uh, beginning the plan, um, the grand opening for the event. We created a uh, planetarium show for the McCullough Space Center. All right. And so the show is called Alakwasik, which means of the stars. And the, the planetarium show is, the, is telling the story of how the big bear and the little bear ended up in the sky, you know, the big dipper and the little dipper. And so um, that will be coming out in a couple of weeks um, because this is what we do. There's a curriculum coming out to go along with the film. Um, that we're currently working on. I'm not sure if the curriculum will be done in time for the opening, but we're really trying hard. Um, but yeah, so we're really excited about this um, upcoming event. I created, I narrated and created the storyline. So, yeah, so I was like the producer. Voice. <laughs> yep. And I wasn't this horse back then. Yeah. Nice. Um, so Richard, Richard Waldron, uh, many of you all know him. Um, we're working on a documentary, Kathleen. Kathleen. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, stay tuned for that. Also, we've been doing a lot of research um, because some of the historical accounts of <coughs> his doings are not even close to accurate. And if you go back to the primary source documents, including the letters he himself wrote, you'll find a very different story. So you know, we've got Waldron Towers. We've got Waldron. Court and um, you know when we when we talk about what we would call the Kachiko retribution, um, you know he's seen as a victim, um, but stuff happened before that incident that um, was ama amazingly awful. Yeah. So we just we just feel that there are two sides to every story, and and when you create a story that is not true or accurate. You're creating propaganda that, that as a result, hundreds of years later, people think that this is what happened when in reality it wasn't. So we're working on that. It, yeah. Yeah. Um, so another one is um, where we talked about the retribution against Ma Major Waldron. Um, so this slide I put in here because um, we're always being asked about historical markers. And so on the left um, is the uh, submitted marker terminology that we submitted for the new historical marker. We based our narrative on first generation original handwritten documents from Waldron himself. We used, did not use secondary materials. We did not use anything other than Waldron's direct words out of that man's mouth and the court records, you know, based in Boston. On the right is the narrative that's being pushed back on. So if you happen to read the one on the left, it talks about how Waldron captured and enslaved, and I'm gonna use round numbers here for the sake of argument, 350 people. On the, on the, um, the revisionist marker on the right, they wanna make it sound like Waldron let all those people go. And he didn't. Those people were sold into slavery into the Azores. But this is showing the inherent racism that still existed in this state. That even using first generation original documents by the man himself, it's still trying to be manipulated to show a colonial supremacy narrative. And so the only reason why I'm pointing this out is so that you understand the level of work that we're doing in the state house and how much effort we're putting into this to, to correct the false narratives. Um, it's, it's, it's incredibly um, difficult and quite frankly, it can be disheartening um, sometimes when you're dealing with this level of racism within the state. So Wana Hillock, the lost ones. Um, this is um, one of the projects that we've I've actually proposed to the town here um, because of Waldron's kidnapping and selling of 350 um, tribal people. Um, we actually proposed starting a park here in town, which consisted of 350 blueberry bushes. So it would be a living memorial. It would also provide food for the community. Um, so our goal here, you know, as we've been talking about sustainability um, within the state, um, we think that this would be a great, yeah, it's obviously all up to y'all, <laughs> but we think this would be a great idea 
um, to highlight um, um, history in the area, hi um, highlight food insecurity in the area, mm -hmm. and making gathering your own food the norm. So what can you do? Be open, question and challenge your perceptions of native people, because the history that we've all been taught has been manipulated. And sometimes it can be difficult to accept and understand um, the true history of the region. Learn how to be a good ally, uplift and include indigenous voices and causes, and know when to advocate and when to step back. Our own <laughs> ego plays a major role. We don't like we don't like to let other people take control of things. We always have to, you know, maintain some level of control. Um, this is one of those situations when we talk about indigenous history, we reach out to our partners, we work together, but we wanna really lift up, uh, um, uplift the indigenous history of the region. Um, be humble, focus and listen. Um, the injustices of native people um, and how to discuss those injustices, discuss the inherited history. None of us created this mess. We're all just living with the after effects. So it's inherited history. I can't yell at any one of you for anything that happened in any of this presentation. Just like you can't yell at me for any of it. We're all just stuck here living with this narration. So we have a choice. You know, we, we have a choice to move forward with the parts that work for us and, we, and change and leave behind, you know, the stewardship practices that don't work for us. And so we're asking um, our community partners to think about environmentalism and what's happening in their community and make decisions um, that'll benefit the longer um, history for the region. Uh, donate to indigenous tribes and organizations, include sustainability in your corporate and personal practices, and be good stewards of our homelands and waterways. I cannot stress this one enough. If you do nothing else, and I literally mean if you do nothing else, please take care of this land. If we kill this place, we're killing ourselves. And what kind of message is that for our grandchildren? You know, as indigenous people, we want them to understand the level of love we have for them by, by protecting this place and making sure it's gonna be there for them in a healthy and in a safe, sustainable way. And we're not doing that right now. So we need to stop, think about what we're doing, think about this, the message we're sending to our next generations and adjust our behavior accordingly. That's it. We made it. So at questions? this point, questions, do I dare ask? <laughs> we covered a lot of ground. And uh, it's luckily I'm muzzled because I go, we'd be a lot longer today. <laughs> Kathleen knows. Just refresh my memory. You were talking about the differences, the way the, the Lenape and the Abenaki looked at wolves. Uh -huh. and oh, yeah. I really, it's like, I know it was different, but I don't know which was what. All right. The Abenaki uh, told all the oral traditions through Gluskabe, kind of like a Paul Bunyan, like a mythical superhuman. And when we, we only figured this out recently when uh, Mohegan came up into our area and started talking about their oral traditions where it was and the we're, wolf. We're, can't, we're comparing oral traditions. Yeah, right. And they kept on talking about the wolf. And being, we're like, why are you talking about the wolf? The wolf is the evil of the being. If you go to a casino, like it it's all about the wolf, right? Mohegan's son is the wolf. Oh, okay. And we said, <laughs> boy, uh, that's kind of interesting. And all their oral stories are based on the wolf. Whereas Molson, the wolf, the wolf in our language, was always considered evil, and Guscabe was always fighting evil, which was Molson. So when we heard the switch, we knew something was wrong. But then we well, not that something was wrong, but, but we it knew that there was a cultural shift. A and cultural why shift. Was there that much of a shift? And it seems to be once you get out of the lower tier of New England, Guscabe takes over oral traditions as being the good guy and the wolf becomes the, the evil one and it, it's strictly the groups that are along the connecticut you know connecticut and rhode island are along the coast and that fit in with what the lenape said about the wolf clans left the main body of traveling people 
and form their own tribes in Connecticut and Rhode Island. So it's a devil in these little details that even the tribes today don't even look at this themselves because everybody has got tunnel vision about their own history and they don't look to the side and figure out what's going on. Right. We We're do, more interested in the relationships yeah. amongst the people. We yeah. do so much deep research. It, it, and, and we always get pushback because federal tribes always say we know more than you unfederalized tribes, but they never do the deep research. They have been living with their own stories for so long, they don't see this. So it, it's right. fascinating to so, us. So just to take a step back, um, the average person isn't going to figure this stuff out. I'm going to be quite blunt. Um, the only reason why we're able to figure out a lot of the, um, uh, the, the migratory history of tribes throughout the United States are Paul and I are federal religious advisors. And so we go in and we meet with tribes all across this nation, including Hawaii and Alaska. And um, we have conversations about culture, about history, uh, you know, and, um, and what we're doing is we're actually comparing with each other because we're all working out where we came from. You know, who's related to who, what migratory pattern happened here, who went where when, and how, you know, and then how are those interrelationships, you know, connected to today. And so um, even in the prison system, you know, these are the conversations that we're having, you know, because we're all trying to figure out where we came from and how we're all intermarried. We have figured out, though, there was two migrations, one from Mesoamerica, and they brought a linguistic, linguistic groups that formed like the Cherokee and all the Iroquois Confederation. And probably the Suian culture also came from Mesoamerica. But what we see is the Algonquins came from Asia, which were an Algonquin language based people. And that crested along basically the Canadian US border was all the Algonquins who were traveling that way into New England. They didn't get pushed back until about 1400s when the Iroquois Confederation became so strong, they forced the Lenape back out of the Hudson Valley and back into the Ohio Valley. So we're, we're really looking at that time period between 1 AD and 1400 AD, which there's no real written history about. And we're trying to figure it out by looking at all kinds of records and oral traditions. Right, archaeology. Archaeology. It, it's a devil in the fact there's so little known. We only probably know this much, you know, just, just a smidgen. But in the oral traditions, you will find the clues of what's going on. Just right. like all in the, the language. In the language. You know, just the fact that I have words for pterodactyl, that tells you how long we've been here. So when we say we've always been here, we literally mean it because our language says we've always been here. People will push back and say, you didn't see a pterodactyl. But it, how do we have a word for it if we didn't see it? If we didn't know it existed? Yeah, you know, it's just like all the big megafauna. We were pretty sure, like there was always elk and caribou and things like that in New England. But the thing is always a devil in details. We had woodland bison. We had camels. These are all the paleo animals that were along the glacier as, as it was receding. Right. We had alligator up here as well. Yeah, which we don't, it doesn't make any sense. But in our language, it's a proto-Algonquin. It's one of the older dialects. So when you go, you look at the Algonquin language, you go to Blackfoot, they don't have those words. The Ishnabe, the Ojibwa, they, they don't, don't have, have the words. But we do. So we were here earlier than all the rest of them. So that's what we're trying to figure it out. The oldest archaeological site they found in the state of New Hampshire is 12,800 years old. It's actually 13, I think, now, isn't it? No, 12, eight. 12, 12 eight? is what 12, Dick Bovier said. Yeah. Yeah. I, just, um, I round to 13. <laughs> well, but years, that I mean, was up north, so here probably yeah. 13. Well, yeah. you have to understand, as the ice was melting, whatever was sitting as archaeological finds was moving with the ice as it was moving. Yeah. Yeah. So what may have started out, I don't know, and this is gonna be a super <laughs> exaggeration, something that could have started out in New Jersey may end up in Connecticut as an archeological dig. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and so we have to take archeology span with a grain of salt as well, um, yeah. but we're using all of Western science um, to prove our indigenous history. Our goal is to take us out of folklore and put us into fact. 
You know, why is every other culture, their oral history is considered a fact, but in Native Americans, it's considered fiction. It's a story, all right? And so what we're doing is we're using Western science to prove our stories are facts, cool. and it's working. We actually use nuclear chemistry yeah. to, to analyze some of this stuff, and most tribes are like fearful of science. We're so progressive, we embrace all the technologies, nuclear and others, because without getting real scientific proof, we'll never really have an answer, you know, an answer to some of these questions we raise. Like we'll be doing lipid tests on that fat that we saw rendered. We'll be able to analyze, was it seal, was it salmon, was it alewives? We'll be able to do things like that. What's hurting us is these cost a lot of money. Right. Funding is always the issue. We have so many projects going on, and some of them are just stymied because of budget. Um, and it's not that the work isn't you know, exciting and exhilarating, because it is, um, but it's just a matter of getting um, people um, on board with yeah. the whole project. I've been reading the Viking sagas, and this is where it really gets interesting, that time period like 1000 AD. They were here. We know they were here. We gotta, what we're trying to do, everybody thinks it's way up in you know, Labrador somewhere. I've identified from reading sagas, there's at least four places that they were here. And one of them, by their own description of sagas, sounds an awful lot like Great Bay. Right. And I, I want to do archaeology, but we're, we're losing our archaeological sites because of climate change. Right. The, the raising of the water, the coastline, is actually wiping out a lot of these archaeological right. sites. Um, so climate change has always been happening. We'll just put that out there. So this is not a new thing. It goes up and down. Star Island was part of the mainland. The mainland actually extended 70 miles beyond Star Island. That's how much wind we've lost due to climate change over the thousands of Well, years. a lot of it was glacial suppression, yeah. and then it came back up. But nonetheless, we've lost all that land. You know, we, we've gone out on Star Island, and we've found archaeological finds that are 3,800 years old. Right. You know, that's the oldest drill point we found on the island. Mm -hmm. Smutty Nose um, has a lot more artifacts that are even older. Um, but it just shows that these spaces have been used um, for all this time, and they're still being used today. We find, you know, the ground fishermen, the ones that use the nets, pull up mastodon bones all the time off of Rye and Portsmouth. Mm -hmm. So we know there was a plane. There was right. like they a, were grazing. They were grazing all the way out to Star Island. And that, they were they were here when we were here. Yep. Yeah, they were here when we were yeah, here. We you'll see an augmented, you know. Yeah, you'll yeah. see it on our augmented reality. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah hunt, us hunting mastodons, you know. Yeah. And it, the word for the mastodon was the strange animal with the curled lip. So imagine how close we had to be to that thing to see the little tiny lips. <laughs> Yeah. Any other questions? Yep, go ahead. Um, just really delighted, you know, in hearing the connection of the ind indigenous uh, uh, with the environment, right? But is there also now, I'm really excited, you know, studies uh, dealing with the music mm -hmm. of indigenous people in this area, and also what I've read recently on uh, indigenous uh, health and fitness uh, called movement. Can you talk about that? Well, music, musicology is interesting. I'll give you a little anecdotal story here. Princeton got a hold of us uh, a few years back. Five or so years ago. And they had a, uh, a Roman Catholic uh, choir, him. Uh, choir uh, ceremony that was done up in Quebec. And uh, they it was in Abnaki. And uh, they got a, and it, it was translated into Latin and in Old French. And Princeton couldn't figure out the Abnaki, you know, the Abnaki words. So they approached us. We thought it was interesting because the choir singer that they hired, the, the opera singer, uh, wanted to do it right. It was interesting. When we analyzed it, it was supposed to be about the good shepherd shepherding his flock. It wasn't though. Our women had played a trick on the Jesuits. They feminized the shepherd. It was a shepherdess, which was 
taking um, care of her flocks. Right. They pushed against the male patriarchy. Yeah. Um, and the male dominated God because in our religious viewpoints, God doesn't have a gender. Um, we cannot assign a gender for what we do not know. And, um, and so it's very simple. That was one of the major issues that we had with Catholicism um, is the patriarchy. The patriarchy. It's still, um, it's still very still rampant in, in yeah, Canada. Still a, fun, still a major issue today. In Canada, you can't be a tribe unless you descend from a male, from males, leaders. Right. Following the patriarchy. That law finally changed about five years ago. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that shows you the level of oppression that indigenous people have been living on, not just on this side of the border, but on the other side of the border, where if you came from an indigenous woman, you lost your heritage. It didn't matter. You know, you were only native if you came from a native male. It didn't matter who your mom was. And that's a fundamental problem, you know, not just for us as human beings, but to just completely discredit and eliminate women from society in that manner is just unspeakable. To what us. was the second part of your question? Uh, just that I've been reading more on uh, indigenous viewpoint of health and fitness is motivated more towards overall movement yeah. of the body, the family, everything. Yeah. It's exciting. I don't know much, but I just wonder if you guys have touched on that at all. It's starting to grow, seems like, across America. Yeah. You want to talk about ECHO at all? Um, so we're in the process of doing um, an ECHO program. Um, and ECHO is a, um, it's a national program um, that's run through um, the health association, not the health association, but um, the health, like hospitals throughout the nation. And what they do is they bring in um, experts in different fields and um, from all over the region, and they bring them together in one conference and we have open discussions. We, um, um, they give a, um, a medical issue and then they come to the community players and say, how would you try to solve this issue within your community? So the ECHO that we're currently um, participating in, and Kathleen is a member of this panel as well, is about um, mental health and the environment. Mm -hmm. All right, because we're having an extreme um, situation within this country um, with mental health and, and the, a complete disconnect with our environment. And so our goal is to reconnect individuals and not to deal with them on an individual basis with their mental health, but to treat the family. Because this isn't a problem just for that individual. Um, this is a situation that's happening for the entire family. And so the individual needs to learn how to function within society and, order, and learn how to take care of themselves. But the family needs to be there in order to help support um, and the, in this process to ensure success for their family members. And so um, we're trying to push um, more community-based um, education and healing. Um, and by using the environment in that process. Um, it's so easy to take someone who may be depressed and introduce them to fishing or butterfly catching or you know, grape picking or whatever to give them a sense of peace and calm and help them adjust to their society in a, you know, in a productive manner. And so we're trying to um, push that narrative um, beyond our current you know medical practices into something that's more inclusive you can um, look up echo it's it's a national movement uh the first one we participated in was dartmouth dartmouth medical and health sponsored the first one in this region i think well they've been doing them for a long time yeah. but the first one that we were actually involved in and now UNH is doing one as well. Right. Um, so this is the new and up and coming movement um, when it comes to the medical industry and um, how we're working within the communities to uplift not just the indigenous, but all of us, yeah. um, because it's not just us as Indians or as indigenous people that need to get out into the, you know, into the enjoy the environment. It's all of us. Um, and so we want to create um, places through parks or other means where we can connect people to the environment. Do you want to say anything, Kathleen? We'll just keep rambling. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, stressing the community with the ECHO program. Yeah. And um, it, a lot of it is based on what, what has been termed climate trauma, yeah. because people are so panicked about what's actually happened around us, at least the ones who know what's happening around us are. And you know, how do we deal with that as families, as communities, um, as a nation? 
So it, right. it's a really interesting program. Right. That's why we're pushing the edible gardens, you know, edible landscaping. This is part of that mental health stability program, you know, where not only can we help, um, you know, garden and create um, some sort of um, neutrality in the stress levels of society, um, but we're feeding each other in the process, you know. Grow a backyard garden. Yeah, yeah. yeah really, you should. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, is this presentation going to be available for viewing? After they recorded it. We recorded it, but the, there's the slide issues, and so it's, it's not the best recording, unfortunately, but it will be up on the library's website. And, and also look on INHC, on indigenousnh.com. Right. We have a lot of stuff on there. We have um, little, um, some, I don't want to call them flyers. They're like, tri not trifolds, but third cut um, information for in both Indigenous NH and our tribe. Um, so if people want to reach out, have questions, or just want to learn more, grab um, a, a flyer, if you will, um, and it'll help you. Um, get some of that information. Plus, it will give you ability to contact Kathleen, Paul, or myself as well. Just so people understand, the uh, INHCC was actually created using a lot of the faculty at UNH, but they didn't want to live within the UNH construct of control. They wanted to be independent in thinking and not being constrained by university policy. So we developed this as a forum for a lot of the professors, researchers, and others to step out of the UNH environment and actually work with indigenous communities. Right, That's brilliant. right. with no holds barred. No holds know? barred. So we have an un, unrestricted environment. And our partnerships- And I, if anything, we push them a little bit. <laughs> well, we push UNH real hard. Uh, partnerships are now, if I gave you, we'd have to have a PowerPoint slide for, on all the partnerships we have conservation groups and you know marine scientists it goes on and on and on what we've done is we've brought a lot of people into one particular area to voice their opinions and we we cherish it kathleen's been with us we read along yeah, go ahead not so much a question but maybe an offer uh, you've got four members of the dover city council here tonight uh, I'll, I'll kind of speak for them and they can throw something at me if I'm wrong, but uh, I think we'd like to help you advocate for the truth and the Waldron, uh, the Waldron plaque. Uh, maybe we can, we can talk I'm loving you right now. And, yeah. uh, uh, so we can put a resolution together, start to advocate, get the right people to know, you know, that the truth does need to be out there. So I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll reach to a through an email address, I'll reach out and we can start having some. We'd like to have a green space in town too to plant. 350 blueberry bushes. Just nudge the mayor. About <laughs> and, and we can we'll always dig in tomorrow. <laughs> we can hit up. And I actually have money to buy the bushes already. Someone loved the idea we'll so much they made they made a donation um, to to for us to buy the bushes. There is some city owned green space in a lot of different places. So and we recognize yeah. they be scattered around town. Well, and that's the thing. We recognize 350 bushes is a lot of bushes. <laughs> and we're trying to be realistic here. So our goal, believe it or not, is actually to start a blueberry garden and then taking the extra bushes and planting them around town. Actually, so, you know, plant them at the library here, plant them at the town right hall, down, plant them at the courthouse, plant them wherever, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's, it's about creating a living memorial. And these memorials are um, great for not just indigenous people, but for others who have lost loved ones unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. You know, it gives a place where, or, you know, um, when I was researching to try to get pictures for my slide for that, um, I couldn't tell you, how, I, I was shocked how many prom photos I found with people in blueberry patches. And I almost stuck a prom picture in there, but I'm like, ah, eh, they might think I'm a little weird for that. Um, but yeah, I was surprised how many people use these spaces for family photos or, you know, memorial photos um, for a special moment in their life. <laughs> so um, but yeah, it's just another idea, um, but it's once again, it's about pulling us all together and deciding what's best for all of us. It's not just about uplifting an idea just because we happen to give it to you. If it doesn't work, then let's develop something that's better. And blueberries make beautiful bushes. And, and, and in the fall, video. they're beautiful colors. You know? Yeah. And they're good. They're yummy. And they're yummy. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.